was a joke. Because they were just come to now before they could you know relax. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Good to see you guys. This is my first session in April, April the 2nd. That's okay. That's fine. Finish your sentence. So you got the, 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 the okay, good stuff. Beautiful. I would like to welcome Leanne. Leanne, she's Leanne right there from Kelowna, visiting with Kathy and related to Terry and uh, the family and so forth. So I'm glad to have you this morning among us to carry on with the book of Ephesians. Uh, Lee, Brandon, Sylvie, beautiful. We're missing a few players tonight, to this, uh, to this morning, but it's okay. They sent me an email and so on. Welcome to those who are watching on the YouTube channel right now. You are welcome. And if you need to catch up or if you need to need, uh, obtain any kind of outlines, you email Olga, my wife, to get what you need to do. So before I start with a word of prayer on the TV screen, <clears throat> you have basically what I left you with, okay, last week, simply because, uh, not negative comments, but you know that uh, the Sword Ministries, we do present here um, studies that are very much in-depth type of thing, and uh, I don't know, uh, have you, do I have anybody in the class with the number of weeks that we have done only in Ephesians? No? Uh, on chapter one, we spend six weeks, I think, type of thing, because it's so dense and so compact. And at the same time, pardon me? I'm sorry, I think it was February 5th that we started. That's it. If you can count after the break, I'll ask you. Um, it's so dense and, again, necessary to embrace, to have a better appreciation of our position in Christ and everything that he has done for us. So that's why I gave you the redemption obtained, the forgiveness obtained, the mystery known to us, and all that kind of stuff. A recipient of irresistible grace or efficacious grace. We are sealed by the Spirit. We have access to wisdom, revelation, and knowledge. Not new knowledge, but we can comprehend the text. Any books of the scriptures, uh, even the most difficult, like Isaiah, Job, and so on. Because of the work of illumination of the Spirit, we have the capacity to comprehend these things. His power towards us, that so that we are been, uh, we have been rendered capable of fulfilling our gifts given by the Spirit and so on, to do what we have to do. We have been co-risen with Him, and we definitely, definitely have an heavenly position, which we don't obtain right now because we're still in the process of sanctification. But positionally speaking, we have heavenly citizenship. We are in Christ, and Christ is in us. And he is in the third heaven as a man. This is a doctrine that is very dear to me. There is only one man with a human body, glorified body, though, in heaven. All the other saints, saints that are in heaven right now are there only with the immaterial part of man. He is the forerunner. He is in the third heaven, okay, as a man sitting at the right-hand side of God the Father. You are in him and he is in you. So positionally, positionally speaking, God sees you right now. The Father sees us as already been glorified. So that was basically where I left you last week. And now we take another passage. We are still under the doctrinal treatise, basically, of Ephesians until we reach chapter 4, verse 1, with the famous conjunction, therefore. So we are still on the theological side of it. We are under capital B. On page 1 of your outline, we will attack today chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. I don't know how deep we will go, but we will take it one chunk at a time. Why don't we take our usual few seconds of silent time, and then we move on. Gracious Father, we give you thanks once again for another month that you brought in 
the month of April, sustaining us by your glory and your grace. I thank you again for the group that is physically in front of me right now. Thirsty for your word, Father, with a willingness to bow the knee to the text and embrace what we need to embrace from you, and there is a lot. For the next hour, 15 minutes, maybe, Father, help us to shovel aside any kind of hindrances that would keep us from receiving what we need to receive. We're not at Coast Capital here, nor TD Banks, so for a minute, Lord, help us to change the screen. We give you thanks already for what we will be receiving. Help me out to be efficient in communicating these things. And we give you the glory and the honor, dear Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn in your book of Ephesians, <coughs> chapter, two, verses one, verse, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Before reading a verse, make a note of this. Paul once again here, once more, he moves from the height or the heights of our position to the level of the state in which we are here. He moves from the positional truth, from the heavenly explanation, to a more level ground here of what we were prior to salvation. Of what we were prior to the salvation in a state of unbelief. So basically you can picture this by going up because he was explaining heavenly things here and now he is going back to a more earthly plane here prior to our salvation. That's the second time in the letter or in the uh, epistles that he does that here. That's why it's entitled Saved by Grace under capital B. Let's read a few verses. Uh, maybe what, let's read the 10 verses slowly. I'm going to ask you to circle a few things and then we get on to your, uh, into our usual style of the exposition. Come with me. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin. Circle trespasses and sin. In which you, circle the pronoun you, formerly walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, circle the prince of the power of the air, in the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, verse 3, we too, circle we too all, formerly lived in the lust of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, circle emphatically, but God, rich in mercy, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we, circle we, were dead in our transgression, made us alive, circle that expression, together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ, in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, circle the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us, in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. I would, if I would be you, I would circle the totality of verse 8. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, circle workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, circle good works which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. When you use a closer version to the original Greek, such as the ASV of 1901, ASV of 1901, it goes like this here for verse 1, and you did he make alive when you were dead? You know that you might have this in your text, I don't know, but that's how it reads in the closer original Greek. And you did he make alive when you were dead in your trespasses and sin. In the Greek construction, like I just said, 
the verse 1 is an incomplete statement. In the Greek text, your verse 1 is an incomplete statement at this point. But God and Paul are faithful, of course. It's more explained in verse 5. In verse 5, which I read already, you have the more completed statement. Verse 5 reads as follow. And when we were dead in, your, in our transgression, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So the incomplete statement that you have in verse 1, we're provided the more completed statement in verse 5. I did ask you to circle the pronoun you in verse 2 and the pronoun we in verse 5. Why, did I, why have I done that? It's the we counts for the Jewish people because Paul is Jewish and the you of verse 2 counts for the Gentiles. So simply put in your notes that the blessings of chapter 1 verse 3 extends to the Jewish people of the church age and the Gentiles. That's why in verse 2 when he says, in which you, Gentiles, formally walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit, lowercase s, that is working in the sons of disobedience, so the you and we express the same truth for both groups. Let's go back to verse 1b, trespasses and sin. We were dead in trespasses and sin. I have no need to tell you that the death there spoken of in verse 1 is not physical death. It's spiritual death. And what is spiritual death? We were born like this. That's why there is the need to be quickened in the spirit. Spiritual death is to be separated from God. It's prior to salvation. I was in that state for 33 years. I was not... Brought up as a Christian. So all of us were born in total depravity, total inability, so we were born spiritually dead. Because of the sin passed down from the original parents, Adam and Eve. And what is the remedy for it? It's to be made alive. To be quickened is the Greek word, quickened in the spirit. And I trust that all of you have been. I know you are enough to be able to confirm that. And when we talk about the issue of having been quickened in the spirit, it is not a process. It is instantaneous. It happens on the day of salvation. It happens on the day of salvation. That's the day that you have been justified or saved, which is the same. You have been quickened in the spirit. And that day you were joined or united to Christ automatically. Quickened. It's quick. Quickened. Quickened. Uh, united. Unquickened. It's a Q. Oh yeah, I didn't put the knickknack here. Okay, gotcha. Okay, quickened in the spirit, or you have become partakers of the divine nature. This is huge. You should make a note. Because of our union, because of having joined in Christ, we became partakers of the divine nature. We don't become God but we partake in the divine nature. And all of this, beloved, is by the work of his power. You do not pray to obtain this. It's already yours. 
This is very important to use our time of prayer efficiently. In a, in a state of salvation, you cannot ask God to be joined and united with Christ or quickened in the spirit to become partakers of the divine nature. It is a cashed deal, cast in stone right now, as soon as you got saved. And I'm talking about the remedy here of verse 1, and you were dead in your trespasses and, and sin. I'm just elaborating a little bit on that here. Verse 1c, trespasses and sin, circle that. There are many, many words for sins in Hebrew and even in the Greek, but the main one, trespasses and sin, is hata in Hebrew. Atta in Hebrew and in Greek, amartia. What do they mean? What does it mean to transgress? And sin, in a nutshell, it means to miss the mark. That's what it means, to miss the mark. There is more to that, but it's not a study of sin, but hata in Hebrew and hamartia in Greek means this, to miss the mark. And how what it is to miss the mark, it's to come short of that which God intended for us. I repeat, it's to come short of that aim which God intended for us. And all of us fall short. All of us with no exception. To miss the mark means this, to fall short of that aim which God intended for us. It goes back to the fall of Adam. They were created in holiness. He dropped the ball in Genesis chapter 3. So all humanity fell short of his glory. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. That's what it means to be dead in trespasses and sin. All the babies of the world today are born with the sin nature. Even my daughter, she has the sin nature generated by us, us by my parents going back to Adam and Eve. So that's why we're born in total depravity. Everybody is standing in need of being quickened in the spirit. No exception. Questions on this? Okay, remember always the three God gave them, God gave them, and God gave them of Romans chapter 1, 24, 26, and 28. We have been placed at that place by divine decree. We cannot argue with this, yeah, but I have been good to all my family. I've sent my kids to university. That does not and cannot commend you to God. I did many good deeds from zero age to 33 years of age, helping elderly lady to cross the street as an extent, as an example. That cannot commend me to God. The only thing that commends us to God is to be clothed, spiritually speaking, with the righteousness of Christ. So we need to understand that. And the three God gave them are in chapter 1, 24, <clears throat> 26, and 28. We have been placed at that place, spiritually dead by divine decree, but he has chosen some as recipients of grace, which is you and I, of course, with no merit attached to it. If you want to add a sentence in your notes, there is no rescue, <clears throat> rescue possible apart from the quickening regenerating power of the Spirit of God. I repeat, there is no rescue possible apart from the quickening slash regenerating power of the Spirit of God. That's what I meant here on the TV screen.
by the being recipient of the irresistible grace, causing us to be willing to receive salvation. Meaty, it is meaty. Verse 2, in which you formerly walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is working in the sons of disobedience. Circle also in which, the in which here refers to the things, what thing in verse 1? Transpasses in sin, in which they're connected together. That's what we were walking in, trespasses in sin. And you cannot walk if you're dead. So we were physically alive, but spiritually dead. So here, once again, we were separated, spiritually separated from God. When I, from 0 to 33, I had nothing to show that was to God that was I was deserving salvation. It was me, myself, and I, and I, myself, and me. All about me, my career, my stuff, my house, my car, my this, my that. So that's basically it. Nothing can commend us to God. We were all at that place. Without exception, we were all, to an extent, missing no, the mark despite of, a, of our goodness or badness, if you want to put it this way. Okay, like I said, this is not arguable because that's we have been placed there by divine decree, Romans chapter 1. The you in verse 2, it's basically the Gentiles. Remember the three groups. When I wrote that down here, it's very significant because what basically Paul does when he explains Romans is talking about what we call the pagan Gentiles. Those who worship naked on the uh, most remote Pacific Islands, like the, uh, the people that are not cultured. He is talking about also in chapter 1 about the cultured Gentiles, such as the Romans and the Greek people from where we get the philosophy, Philo and all that kind of stuff, and the Jews. All are without excuse. Jews are not Gentiles. So basically it leads to Romans chapter 3 verse 9 and 23. All fall short. Including these Jewish people at the wall that seems to be godly. We all fall short of the glory of God. Christians are not born. They are made. And when you look at verse 2 here, not verse 3, but 2 for a quick moment here, uh, it applies to all without exception that we were under the control of the prince of the air. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, that's the God of this world with a small g. Germain, we talk about a lot about it, that this earth basically is under the satanic power. He stole that power when Adam fell. Not without the, 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 the omniscience and the sovereignty of God, but the prince of this cosmos with a K. That's the system under which we are, and that's the system from which we were saved. The dominion of the prince of the air. So this cosmos lies here in the lap of the satanic and demonic power. So we are still in it now, but we're not of it because we have been redeemed from it. This is not redeemable. The system that you see outside, armaments, war, education, Darwinism, and so on, isn't redeemable. It cannot be redeemed. Only the people within can be redeemed. So do not hope for a better government. It will not happen. Reference from the Prince of the Heirs, our 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. And the book of John, chapter 16, verse 11.
That system does not have any more power over you. You don't need to serve it. You have been freed from it to serve the Lord. You still have to go to work and so on, but that should not be your God. I need to pay for my food, and I don't have a special highway for Christians. You're going to go back to Kelowna. There is not a highway, Christians only. You're going to have to drive beside, behind, and in front of the unbelievers. But we need to understand together that we are not of it. We are in it, but we are not of it anymore. That's what we have been rescued from. So once we understand Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all fall short of the glory of God, and when we read Galatians, we read, we did Galatians already in chapter 3, verse 22, it says this, but the scriptures has shut up everyone under sin, comma, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might give it, be given to those who believe. It was Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. And his promises are given to you and me. Not easy stuff to teach nowadays. And to be under sin, if I go back to Ephesians chapter 2, in you formerly walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and of the spirit that is working in the sons of obedience, to be under sin means to be under a sinful system. A system that was holding dominion over us that should not be old dominion over us anymore. The cosmos. And keep in mind that should be held to be true because it's by divine decree. Am I going too fast? No, no. Okay. Beautiful. Verse 3, come. Among them, we too, okay, all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. Sometimes we don't even realize that. Indulging the desire of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Once again, divine decree. But why children of wrath? It means simply deserving God's judgment. That's what it means to be children of wrath. I was one of them for 33 years. You do your own mathematics. Uh, would you repeat that, please? That's it. To be children of wrath, it means to be children of divine, not that it means basically to be deserving, worthy of divine judgment. I like your own notes. We were worthy of divine judgment, but somebody else in whom we believed took our stead, took our place. That's substitutionary. Christ is our substitute, so now we have become a children of light. We still retain the sin nature. I still have within myself and yourself also the capacity to sin even now. But it should not have mastery over us like it did in the past. The sin nature has been nailed to the cross. What was nailed to the cross is the, it, it, it's not the eradication of the sin nature because we retain it. What was nailed to the cross is the mastery that it had over us. Today, it should not master us. I repeat this. When Christ was nailed to the cross, the sin nature was condemned. He paid the price for it. And he frees us in the sense, and because you can argue that, and you would write to argue, what if he nailed it to the cross, Francois, oh, come, I still have it. Because the sin that you have done this morning, or last week, or you will do in 10 years, is done to the sin nature. 
What he nailed to the cross is the mastery, the fact that you don't need to obey the sin nature anymore. You can be guided by your new nature. And to appreciate and to hug tight your salvation, we need to understand these things. This will lead you to appreciate what we are, who you are in Christ, and what I am in Christ. That's why you have been set free, to serve him in righteousness. Sin nature is still there, but no mastery anymore over you. There is always a provision from God present in front of you in your scriptures to escape here. But sometimes it doesn't work because we are weak. And it's okay because he's strong in us. No one is born righteous ever, except Adam and Eve prior to the fall. <laughs> and Jesus, didn't you say? Of course, Jesus never sinned, of course, being God. <coughs> and I'm going to say a sentence right here. There is, there is no real hope. Real hope can never be discovered our real hope can never be fully embraced when we compare that with human merit. And this is us. We like to pay back. But it doesn't work this way. The real hope is embraced when you dismiss completely the human merit and embrace his grace. Unmerited favor. That, becomes, that hope becomes tangible. Because if you want to pay back and if you try to do good, the the harder you will try to do good, the less you will do. I always do the thing that I don't want to do and never do the thing that I would like to do. Paul, Romans chapter 7. Once you release yourself under basking in his grace, now the hope becomes tangible. Man, if I'm trying to achieve my salvation by my own, it's not working. So God is telling you, Beautiful. Great. You got that one. I will make a chief for you. I will bring to pass what I started with you, Brendan. I justified you. I'm sanctifying you right now. And you can be sure, rest assured, that you will be glorified one day. Not because of your own merit, but because of my divine standards and grace. It's very refreshing and very reassuring. Basically, what he does here... In verses 1, 2, and 3, which we basically we have taken here, children of wrath, even as the rest here, he pictures humanity in a dark way. It, everything that I said here was quite dark this morning so far. But it's going to be fun in the next verse. Look at verse 4 and circle emphatically, but God, wouch. The but here is what we call a mighty adversa adversative in the grammar, adversative. We use it a lot. I love you, honey, but drop the but. You're doing well, Germain, but drop the but. It's I love you. No but. But it's an adversative. Here, in verses 1 to 3, it pictures humanity in a dark place, but God. And what's the rest of it? Being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. There is no such a thing in verses 1. In verses 1, 2, and 3, pictures Francois for what Francois was in the flesh. But he doesn't say, but God... Uh, but Francois, last week you talked with an unloving attitude. It doesn't say that, although I can teach in an unloving attitude. But it is forgiven if I did it last week in an unloving attitude. So the phrase remains, but God being rich in mercy, despite of Francois' boo-boo, because of his great love, which he loved us. So it's a mighty adversative. And that's the same thing as in Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. 
If you go to the cafe, you, you, your thumbs are right at the right place. Read that for me, and I just want that word. Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, it's after the flood. Kathy. And God remembered Noah. And God remembered Noah. He's still basically floating on the ark. It says, but God remembered Noah. Do you think that God forgot Noah? No. How come he says, but God remembered Noah? It means in the original Hebrew that God remembered Noah. Now he starts to move towards the object love after the flood. He's been floating there, but God said, oh, man, I was watching the hockey game. and uh, Oh, Noah, that's true. A, no, no. He let go without speaking and so on. But God now starts again to move towards the object love, which is Noah and the family. The, but God hears the same thing. But God here, one day at the age of 33, started to move towards the object love prior to the establishment of the constellation here. He moved towards me. Guess what happened to me was found. How can he forget me since he knew me prior to this? It means that God's heart and his longing for the heart of humanity it starts to move towards the object love. And that's the you and I. That's you and I. Chapter 2, verse 4. This is not Noah right now. This is you. The but God, it's you and I right there. You can place your name there. But God started to move towards me. And this is, not, uh, this is not the fall of man that ignite the attributes of mercy. God did not start to be merciful at the fall of Adam. Oh, make a note of that. God did not start to be merciful at the fall of Adam. God's attributes, he had always possessed them. Okay? He was always merciful. Mercy and forgiveness is always is. We pause, take a short pause, coffee pause and stuff. Yes, uh, Lee.